there, I'm Joseph Schmizi, sales support engineer for Sony Electronics here at the Sony booth at NAB 2011. And what we're standing right next to here is the F65. This is now our new flagship product for the Cine Alta camera line for Sony. And this is our 4K camera. And the kind of leading characteristics and specifications that are of note for this piece of equipment is that we are a numerically honest 4K. And by that I mean in the same way that how when we deal with audio, the human ear, we generally hear around you know, 20 some odd hertz. So that's why when we begin to sample audio in the digital domain, we start at 44.1. We need to have at least double the amount of information we want to end up at. With the F65, that approach, that brute force approach to uh, re capturing resolution is also used. So the imager we have is actually an 8K imager, in which we take all that data and then sample down to 4K. So our process is always to start higher and lower, not to you know, start with just 4K worth of pixels and then have to engage in an interpolation scheme to be able to work my, work my data to get it back up to where I want to be. The other things that are kind of notable about this camera is that it's also going to be uh, tandem with our SR memory products and our new SR master line of uh, recording options. What you're looking at on the camera is called the SRR4. And that's the one. The 4 is meant to go with the 65. We'll also have the SRR3, which will dock physically to the F35. And then we have our R1, which is a standalone recorder. The R4 is the biggest and baddest of all our SR memory recorders that we'll be releasing. It'll do all the flavors of uh, our SR codec, including the new 220 megabit. So when you start looking at our recording times, which I actually have a card right here, this is what our SR memory cards look like. This is a one terabyte card. So if you're sh uh, shooting our 220 megabit codec, that would give you eight hours uh, on a one terabyte card. So then 440 SR codec that you used to record to your SRW1s off of an F23, that one's going to be at four hours. And then the 880 would be two hours. And if you were to be shooting the lightly compressed uh, 4K in the camera, uh, that will give you about 50 minutes and change worth of recording time on a one terabyte card. But the other thing that's notable is that this camera will also produce a 16-bit linear sensor data package that can also be recorded to the card. Right now we haven't been able to do any testing with that, but that's the next stage for Sony. What also next to this is our 4K theater where we were able to actually take this camera and shoot a five minute piece just as proof of concept and to ensure and test, begin testing our workflow. And so far the results have been very, very encouraging. So with the R4, you get to record linear sensor data, you get all the flavors of SR, and you can also do uncompressed DPX in there. So that's another advantage. Um, and we're still benchmarking the DPX times right now. Um, with the R3, at the F35, you can do the 880, the 440 megabits, and the DPX. And the R1 tops out at 440, more meant to be in tandem with the F our new PMW F3 camera. I always kind of feel a little weird talking about this camera because every other time I've uh, had to have a 4K conversation, we're all discussing about how we've fundamentally changed what cameras are and blah, 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 blah. This is just a camera. It just happens to do 4K. Um, and right now, from our visual tests that uh, Curtis Clark was our DP on ASC, um, without having being able to, you know, just we needed to get that done so we couldn't be as scientific as we wanted to, but visually we're able to at least see now a minimum of 14 stops of dynamic range. And when we actually get to do full scientific testing with cameras that haven't just gotten off the presses, we should be able to get, you know, a little bit more uh, benefit and increase there. So we're very excited with what we've seen with the uh, F65 and what want to see what its full potential will be. And we're looking to have this camera show up in the wild, you know, October, November-ish time frame, but we don't have a hard date for it yet. And the memory also will be coming out around that time. And we're going to be deploying a full system. So we'll have the camera, we have a recorder, we have an entire new product set uh, that post houses can take advantage of that allow you to work with all this data at, uh, in, you know, real time or slightly faster than real time. Because the one thing we didn't want to do is actually hand you 4K worth of data and then have your systems choke on it. So. We were actually supplementing that all out—a complete suit solution from the front of the end, from the front of the lens, all the way back. And I guess one of the other just notable things to know about this camera is that, unlike a lot of also big digital uh, cinematography uh, machines, we also will include with this camera the option to have a mechanical shutter. Now, I can—I'll speak—I I will defend this mechanical shutter. Uh, I'm sorry, the electronic shutter. 
But if you absolutely need it, need it, if you're shooting high speed, the option is yours now, and we can bring that in. Um, that's not yet decided. Uh, with that many chips, that much resolution, you know, there are trade-offs when engaging in that system. And on top of it is. Uh, as nice, and I understand the reasons for an optical viewfinder, and believe me, everybody that's come up has said it, it's just one of those things where at 4K resolution, a digital device is a better tool to gauge your focus. Pixel zoom is going to be the thing that lets you know whether you're in or out. I mean, and I wish my eye was that good, but that's just sort of the, the ebb and flow that we're kind of figuring out right now with working with this camera, because there's a set workflow, there's a post workflow, and all those are getting finalized at the moment. It's a Super 35 sensor, um, you know, so all the same specifications stand for Super 35. You know, we have a, a 28, mil, di 28 uh, millimeter diagonal measurement, you know, and just within the Super 35 space, we've been able to put 8K worth of pixels by 2K down. So that's so that's a data company. Marketing. It well, when we think about it, I mean, it is. You can sort of make a numerical argument for why we can begin to say we have double the, double the amount of resolution of traditional cameras in that size. But it is uh, just the name chosen for it. Okay. So. so let's talk a little bit about, obviously, uh, it is a 4K camera. It's not an 8K recording device. No, no. I, I heard somewhere that is there, is there a possibility at any point to actually sample all of those 8K as usable image? Or they're literally designed for, um, for sampling? Not, not decided yet, not known. Um, right now, all, the, all those things are being uh, discussed, and that's just going to become an argument of need, cost, and you know whether physically you know the hardware is in there to pull off those functions. So, more information will be coming out over the course of the summer, especially as we engage in our tests and interact with the with the industry and get their feedback. And then you know November, fall, really late fall uh, is when we'll really begin to discuss in detail the things uh, that will become true for this camera as, a, as its feature set. Part of the things that we had been working on so long to get to this level of, four, of actual 4K is accounting for things like that, color difference issues, color sampling. Um, as we know, when we're working with CMOS imagers, you know, how you do your color difference, you have to have some form of a dichroic color, color pattern built over the imager to, to get that information. So the reason we have an 8K sensor is that it, we can ensure we have 4K, full 4K of green information, which allows us to have a full 4 for the color sampling for green channel. Then what we do is we have uh, what well, we have a pixel sampling pattern that is different because you have options on how you clock out your ch uh, your information. You can read horizontally, you can vertically, you can sample a bunch of times, you can sample once. So what we do is we have a new pixel sampling pattern that actually moves. Uh, has its own kind of ebb and flow for how it looks at the pixels and samples their data. So what that allows us to do is not only do we have a horizontal, uh, horizontal t uh, resolution and vertical resolution, we're actually now able to derive an e another line of diagonal resolution. So by taking all this extra data, we can create, uh, we can use it comparatively to, we ha uh, to look at the blue and re uh, red information, which is you know, physically only 422 on the chip. Um, and then derive, take that math and derive another pixel value so that we can get the rest of the information based on real, you know, based least on light information, not just based on, you know, really good interpol interpolation algorithm working hard. We can take those numbers, average them together, and add that data back so we can guarantee full 4K green, so a full green channel. On, this is physically on the chip. This is not signal, and that's something that gets confused a lot. You know, where is my 444 coming from? What kind of 444 am I talking about? In terms of physical color capability in the hardware of the chip, this is a 422 imager, which, if you go out and look comparatively at all the other imagers out there, this is the highest amount of color sampling that's currently built into an imager. And that's like energy efficiency, entropy efficiency light in, light out, how much color, you know, how much, how many filters do you have, how much can you derive. So that's just data at that point. So once we can manipulate that data, and since it's so rich, we, I, I am absolutely, you know, the fork, the, the green channel, if four, full, topped out, you're not going to be able to derive better data. And then with this extra, we have the 2-2 two, two physically on the chip, we can work the math then, and again, guarantee a high, very high quality full 444 signal. 
uh, that we can supply later down the line. And then that, that's the number that we end up dealing with in post and that interacts with our monitors. So talk a little bit about, I mean, you intrigued me with the 16-bit raw output. Yeah. So this would be, obviously, undebayered data. How is that going to be handled? How is that going to be debayered? Where does um, it move through the post line? Well, right now we're not really getting too specific on all, all the fine details because they're, they're being finalized themselves. But the rough estimation of the process would be you record to the SR memory, and then we have you know, a transfer station that can either come out into the field or it can be a, a you know, live with post. That would then transfer the data uh, into your post environment. Because the thing is, our cards, the SR memory, is a 5 gigabit sustained data, data transfer rate. And it, at a 1 terabyte, um, we can, you don't want to overwhelm anybody's post environment with that, that much data. So we have uh, this little blade one rack unit uh, device that you can put into your uh, post environment and the cards will go in and it'll allow you to have uh, 10 gig uh, transfer speeds. So if you need to get into your fiber chain that way, um, this is, that'll be the device that allows the cards to get into your system at speed so you don't have to pay that penalty for having that much information. The other kind of cool thing for that uh, unit uh, will be that it'll also, it can sit right on top of any of our HD uh, SRW decks, they have, like our 5800 slash 2. And with that, via the 10 gig E con connection, I can now also put the card in and dump my data down to an SR tape. So SR now is a videotape, but it can also now serve as a data tape, you know, similar in function to how LTO works. So if you have that infrastructure, we didn't want you to have to reinvent the wheel, so now SR can have that functionality added back to it. So, that's a great answer. SR Codec, obviously it's very, very high quality. Mm -hmm. Is it ever going to be licensed to anyone else? Like, will you be able to transport it to any other usable media other than um, Right now, um, in terms of like how the two, our 220 megabit codec, which is new to the SR family, it's our SR Lite. Um, and that's just meant more for television production work. Folks where they, you know, 440 is an incredible bit rate and you have a lot of information to play with, but, you know, sometimes you just can't budget for the storage. The 220, we've done all the work we can to ensure very high data and picture quality. The 220, what uh, we are licensing that to NLE, so Avid and Final Cut, you know, Baselight, all those, you know, we're getting that out there. And then the other codec support, the uh, 44880, is supported out there. But in terms of licensing it to uh, other, other solid state recording uh, manufacturers, that's not quite decided yet. I mean, anything can happen. Uh, but at the moment, uh, you know, uh, as, as our uh, esteemed Japanese say, uh, it's being studied.